Put on your goggles. Observers without goggles must face away from the blast. Astalis Okala. H minus 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Nearly 50 years, the world has lived in fear that for one terrible and final moment, this would be the last image that most of us would see. Now, at the end of the Cold War, it seems as if this global insanity may have been averted. In the wake of disarmament, however, a new and more sinister threat has emerged. What on earth does the world do with all those unused nuclear weapons? Ever since the nuclear genie was released from its bottle in 1945, the world has been engaged in a diabolical race. The race to win a numbers war, the number of times each superpower could obliterate the other's population. At the height of the Cold War, with a combined arsenal of over 70,000 nuclear weapons, it is estimated that each side could kill every one of the other's citizens 17 times over. By the 80s, no one could have imagined what was about to happen. We have agreed to eliminate the world's most dangerous weapons, heavy ICBMs, and all other multiple warhead ICBMs. We shall not fight against each other. This is a solemn undertaking that we are taking today, and it will be reflected as a matter of partnership and friendship in the charter that we are going to sign. Remarkably, in 1991, Russia and America agreed that by the year 2003, each would reduce their atomic warhead stockpiles by over 90%. The era of the global nuclear nightmare was over. Or was it? As much of the Russian Navy was left to rust in peace, Dozens of neglected nuclear submarines sank gently to the bottom of the harbor. For the superpowers, the treaties meant that more than 60,000 nuclear warheads would need to be scrapped. It was to prove much, much easier for the politicians to say than for the scientists to do. I think we have created a Frankenstein's monster in the form of uh, stockpiles of nuclear weapons scattered all over the world. The uh, difficulty is going to be not to convince the majority of human beings, I believe, but to convince those in charge of my country, yours, um, countries all over the world, that nuclear weapons are something that the human race is not equipped to deal with and the record of that is in the last 50 years of what's happened. 50 years in which scientists around the world have diligently and conscientiously devised better and more efficient means of global destruction. In 1933 the world's most famous scientist fled German Nazism to continue his academic research. His name was Albert Einstein. On August the 2nd, 1939, Einstein wrote to President Roosevelt to warn him of a startling development. The letter described recent research, which seemed to confirm the theoretical predictions of his famous relativity theory. Among many radical ideas, it predicted that matter could be converted into energy and thus make a bomb. E is equal mc square, in which energy is per equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy. In an old squash court in the heart of Chicago, 
Enrico Fermi and his colleagues succeeded in generating the world's first atomic chain reaction. They showed that the natural tendency of an unstable uranium atom to give off high energy subatomic particles called neutrons could be used to trigger further instability in other neighboring uranium atoms. These in turn give off yet more high energy neutrons. And this super fast interaction soon infects the entire population in a chain reaction. The result is light, heat and pressure. In other words, a bomb. In 1943, in the mountains of New Mexico, Robert Oppenheimer, under the direct orders of President Roosevelt, assembled a team of eminent physicists. They came from all over America, 18 from Britain, and a few who had escaped the war in Europe. Known as the Manhattan Project, its task was to see if Einstein was right. They experimented with two radioactive elements, uranium, which occurred naturally, but also a new man-made element, plutonium, created just three years earlier. Not only did they have to refine the rare nuclear materials, they also had to find a way to make them explode. It took almost two years, but finally, a car carrying half of the world's stock of the new man-made plutonium was taken to the valley of Jornada del Muerto, the journey of death. To Oppenheimer and his colleagues, it was known simply as Trinity. George MacDonald's ranch house was chosen as the site for the final assembly of the bomb. Optimistically, a jeep was kept outside with its engine running permanently in case of emergency. On July the 14th, the gadget, as the two-ton bomb was known, was hoisted to the top of a 100-foot-high Forest Service watchtower. The scientists were running a sweep and Enrico Fermi was taking bets that the bomb would ignite the atmosphere, wiping out all life on Earth. He was giving especially favorable odds on the mere destruction of New Mexico. A final warning flare was fired on the morning of the 16th of July, 1945. At 5.29 a.m., the last firing circuit connected. After witnessing the blast, Oppenheimer quoted the sacred Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, I become death, the shatterer of worlds. 21 days later, Little Boy, a four-ton untested uranium bomb, was dropped on the Japanese town of Hiroshima. At its pre-assigned detonation altitude of 1,900 feet, it exploded directly above a hospital. It's difficult to know how many died in that instant. Estimates vary between 70 and 100,000. Another 100,000 were to die of the bomb's after effects within the next five years. Just three days later, Fat Man, a different type of atom bomb, fueled this time by plutonium, was dropped on Nagasaki. The Japanese surrendered on August the 14th. We had indeed become the shatterer of worlds. Although there was no one left to fight, the scientists continued developing and improving the bomb to make it more efficient and more deadly. An act of Congress was passed outlawing any further disclosure of nuclear technology, even to the British. It became America's top secret and it was one they wished to keep to themselves. 
Unfortunately, atomic bombs are easy to make. The uh, problem of, uh, is, is centered on getting the material which is necessary to make nuclear explosions. There are two materials. One is plutonium and the other is uranium-235, which exists in nature but has to be concentrated. And the way the bombs work is to assemble enough material in a sphere, usually, so that it can maintain a very fast chain reaction of fission, fission releasing neutrons, the neutrons in turn causing fissions and everything exploding uh, in a giant population explosion of neutrons and uh, fission products. The Hiroshima bomb contained a mass of uranium which was not quite enough to sustain a nuclear chain reaction. To make it explode, an additional mass, a slug of uranium, was fired into a precisely engineered slot. At that moment, the chain reaction achieved, as they say, a prompt criticality. However, uranium is extremely dangerous to handle and very unstable. The first choice for most atom bomb makers is plutonium. And ever since Fat Man, the plutonium heart has come to be known as a pit, the American word for a peach stone. A pit is the interior trigger of a nuclear weapon. It consists of nuclear material, such as plutonium, surrounded by non-nuclear containment material, such as the stainless steel that you see here. The plutonium exists as a shell on the interior of this, so this is a hollow device. An essential part of the weapon function is the injection of a mixture of deuterium and tritium gas. We do so during weapon function in something called the boost process. This material is then compressed very tightly by high explosives to achieve a critical mass, where energy is released by fission reactions of the plutonium. What actually happens as an atomic bomb explodes? Within a microsecond of detonation, the chain reaction causes the pressure inside the pit to reach millions of pounds and the temperature tens of millions of degrees. As the atoms split, energy is released in the form of X-rays, which leave the bomb at the speed of light. The flash sets buildings, trees and people on fire before the explosion has even been heard. Air surrounding the bomb absorbs the X-rays and heats up, becoming visible. The huge increase in pressure creates a shock wave which punches outward from the centre of the explosion. Close behind are winds of over 300 miles an hour, shattering and destroying everything within thousands of yards of ground zero. A giant fireball of hot air starts to rise, sucking up thousands of tons of rock and earth, forming itself into the shape of a mushroom. The cloud will climb to over 50,000 feet, a swirling mass of hot and highly dangerous radioactive particles known as fallout. It will drift with the winds across thousands of miles before it decays and becomes safe. It was a world-beating technology which America wanted to keep secret. But before very long, with the assistance of a few stolen plans, the brilliant Russian physicists Yuri Kariton and Igor Kurchatov were able to copy the Nagasaki bomb. Joe 1 was successfully exploded in August 1949 at Semipalyatinsk, 1800 miles southeast of Moscow. The terrifying global atom bomb race had begun. It was uh, the most exciting period, certainly in my life, and I think for most of the people working at Los Alamos and then later Livermore Laboratory, it was unbearably exciting. And yet we sort of took it in stride in the sense that we were mostly young men, no women at the test site in the Pacific, who were uh, totally excited about what we were doing. And I remember uh, saying to myself, watching these grown men in their 30s mostly in short pants ripped off just above the knee uh, acting like little boys playing with their toys and here we were at uh, toward the end of this playing with megatons 
with explosions, one of which released more energy than all the bombs in World War II. And we were playing. And I guess uh, that to me, in retrospect, starting many years ago, that's come to be a sense of insanity. It was an insanity that seems to have infected everybody. going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. Atta boy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get to any kind of cover. You know how bad sunburn can feel. The atomic bomb flash could burn you worse than a terrible sunburn. It was a mad race that Britain was eager to join. In 1952, on Montebello Island, 60 miles off the Australian coast, final sartorial touches were made to the test dummies. Butter, beef and tea were left out for contamination experiments and the wind was checked to make sure it was blowing away from the mainland. The bomb sat on board HMS Plym. The crew of two had had their supper, set the timer and paddled ashore. Five, four, three, two, one, now. But even as Britain was testing her first atomic bomb, Soviet and American scientists had already achieved the next quantum leap in destructive power the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb. The difference between um, an atomic bomb and uh, a hydrogen or thermonuclear bomb is essentially the difference between fission and fusion. In fission, uh, the process involves splitting atoms of heavy elements such as uranium or plutonium, and that process releases a lot of energy. The early nuclear weapons were all pure fission devices. A fusion bomb involves fusing or joining together uh, light atoms, in particular isotopes of hydrogen, such as tritium and deuterium, to form heavier elements. It's a process that goes on inside the sun. The potential of the thermonuclear bomb was terrifying, and within a decade, Russia had constructed and dropped the largest bomb ever to go off on the face of the planet. It was 5,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped in Hiroshima and estimated to be the equivalent of 60 million tons of TNT. If a, a 60 megaton bomb were exploded on the surface uh, of any city in the world, it would destroy the entire city and most of the suburbs. It would reach out and uh, start fires at distances as much as 30 miles from the point of explosion. It would be a total catastrophe. And the fallout from it, depending on what was downwind, could kill millions and millions of people. One explosion. For almost 40 years, we have lived with the deadly logic of MAD, mutually assured destruction. No one would start a war they couldn't win, and in an all-out nuclear exchange, no one wins. It was one of the ironic cornerstones of global peace. Fortunately for the rest of us, neither of the superpowers pressed the apocryphal red button of madness, and in 1991, both America and Russia started to bring their deadly arsenal back in from the cold. Between them, 
they had agreed to destroy more than 50,000 nuclear weapons. This was to be their final journey to the scrapyards. In 1991, the massive hydraulic presses and crushers started their work. The world's press were invited to watch the destruction of the weapons we had feared for so long. For some, it seemed to be the sad end of an era. The ex-Soviet forces were characteristically direct. They either crushed their missiles in huge industrial presses, or they packed them with a few kilos of plastic explosive and blasted them to bits. Whilst 8,000 miles away, the Americans were perfecting a more surgical technique. But what the world's press had been so assiduously filming was not the destruction of the atomic warheads, but simply the demolition of the empty missile casings. They had reported the destruction of the pistols and rifles, but nobody had said what was happening to the nuclear bullets, the plutonium pits. The chilling truth is that this hadn't been a global scenario which anyone had expected. From day one, when we first produced plutonium in this country, we never had an option for its disposal. The notion always was that we were at war. The production of, of nuclear warheads was the key and the most paramount thing for this country to achieve. The disposal option was always considered something that would be done down the road. But as scientists began to think about what to do about this problem, heavily guarded convoys containing nuclear warheads started converging on central Texas from missile bases around the continental USA. Their destination was, and continues to be, Pantex, just outside of Amarillo. For over 40 years, Pantex has been the final assembly center for most of America's atomic bombs. Now those fearful weapons are coming home unused and unwanted to the biggest nuclear storage depot in America. Pantex is perhaps the most securely guarded installation in the world. Nobody gets in or out without a thorough search by heavily armed guards. Video cameras are on every corner. Ground radar and seismographic detectors stop even the Texas jackrabbits from burrowing under the razor wire fences. The forest of telegraph poles are there to stop uninvited helicopters landing. Machine gun toting armored trucks patrol the nuclear storage areas 24 hours a day. The guards work for the Department of Energy, a super elite private army. Deep within Pantex, the missile warheads and bombs are carefully unloaded and taken to the staging area. Pantex's aim is to dismantle between 1,500 and 2,000 warheads a year. They come in all shapes and sizes, from kilotons to megatons, from bombs to missiles. But before anyone is let loose with a screwdriver, the first stage is to check the weapons for any problems. Have they been damaged or cracked? Or have any of the safety mechanisms been tripped whilst on their fruitless journey to the front line? A powerful scanner checks that the safety systems are all in place and that there is no cracking or corrosion. If no alarms are sounded, the bomb is moved to what used to be known as the assembly area. It's inside these gravel girties, massive blast-protected bunkers, that the real dismantling takes place. The first steps are quite simple. The bomb is stripped down to its constituent parts, all 6,000 of them. The complex aiming mechanism is removed. 
then the bulky parachute assembly. It's by far the largest part of most nuclear bombs and is designed to give the pilot a chance of escape as the weapon falls towards its target. The so-called physics package contains the plutonium warhead. It and its high explosive casing are quickly separated from the rest of the materials and are removed to the high security areas within the Pantex compound. The bomb's gold and silver connectors are extracted for recycling whilst the remaining plastic and metal components are taken and crushed beyond recognition. Later, they will be placed in permanent storage as low-level radioactive waste. But the plutonium pit, the core of the bomb, is kept intact. It cannot be crushed or burnt or destroyed. No simple technology exists for dealing with it, and for the moment, it is to be placed in temporary storage. This innocuous looking metal barrel is to be the resting place for the atomic bomb's core. Surrounded by a cellulose fibre, the pit is placed inside and simply canned. More sophisticated weapons, such as this tomahawk warhead, are subjected to a battery of further tests. Inside its stainless steel casing, the warhead is surrounded by highly radioactive tritium gas, the booster component needed to produce the fusion explosion. Any leakage of the gas would be extremely dangerous. It is sealed into one of the most powerful vacuum chambers in the world. As the air is pumped out to within a few millionths of an atmosphere, the massive pressure differential means that even microscopic cracks in the casing will leak and the gas can be quickly detected. Once made safe, the pits are taken out to the storage area. Built in 1942 to store conventional munitions for the Second World War, these above-ground concrete bunkers are the current resting place for the American atomic arsenal. The barrels containing the pits are placed into stacks, known as four or six packs. A sophisticated hydraulic loader, lead shielded to protect the driver from radiation, gently racks them up against the walls of the bunkers. They don't bother with locks at Pantex. They simply use a forklift to place 40-ton concrete blocks in front of each door. Once racked inside the bunkers, the barrels are barcoded, like baked beans in a supermarket. Laser readers regularly track up and down the rows, checking that the right numbers of barrels are still in place, and that there are no excessive radiation readings, indicating a crack or damage to any of the pits. For the moment, there's nothing else that they can do with them. And until scientists, environmentalists and the government agree on the next steps, this is where they will stay. There are currently seven to 8,000 plutonium pits in storage here, each one more powerful than the bombs that destroy Japan. They're hoping to fit in 20,000 by the end of the decade. At the present time, uh, our objective has been to dismantle on the order of 1,500 to 2,000 nuclear weapons each year. All of the activities of the Pantex facility require uh, very, very high levels of quality assurance and safety. And we've been lucky enough to have avoided uh, a serious incident uh, or accident there. Uh, we, we have a term in this country of six sigma quality, i.e. Uh, one in a million chance that something will, uh, will go wrong. And certainly if there's any place in, in our business that, that this is uh, critical, it is at Pantex. Pantex had a rather ambitious schedule to dismantle uh, nuclear warheads. They ran into some problems. They ran into some transportation vehicle problems, some safety as to how the warheads were being dis uh, transported. They also had a release of a tritium gas from a nuclear um, bomb at the facility. They also had um, a nuclear bomb drop during one of the dismantling operations. As a result of those activities, they have significantly reduced the amount of warheads that they were processing and only actually completed 63 percent of the goal that they had for that year. We think there are other concerns, however, at Pantex that need to be addressed. Virtually all 17 of the major DOE facilities that were responsible for reducing nuclear warheads are contaminated. Um, years ago, in the early 1980s, we did some work for, at that time, for Senator Glenn and put a price tag of cleanup in, as, in the tens of billions of dollars. 
eventually the Department of Energy has increased that estimate to $100 billion about five years ago. Their latest official estimate puts the price tag at $300 billion, but most agree that's probably too low. It will be significantly higher than that, but no one can definitely say how much it will cost to clean up because in many of these facilities, we just don't have the technologies in place to remove the uh, contaminants. So some of these facilities will probably be contaminated for hundreds of years to come. Plutonium was first produced in 1941, the byproduct of uranium decay. Like all radioactive materials, it has a half-life. That is the time it takes for one half of a gram of radioactive material to decay into other elements and particles. Now all of the plutonium on Earth is barely 50 years old, and yet its half-life is more than 24,000 years, longer than the recorded history of civilization. To decay completely, it will take over a quarter of a million years. Because of its properties, both as a weapons component and as a radioactive contaminant, it's becoming the greatest global problem the superpowers have ever faced. Plutonium is a very dangerous material. It has two different types of, of danger. One is its toxicity as a heavy metal. The other is its uh, radioactive characteristics. The chief problem with plutonium in the radioactive uh, realm is the emission of an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus. Now this particle is very heavy and slow moving and doesn't easily penetrate other materials. A layer of dead skin cells will easily stop an alpha particle. So plutonium outside the body is really not a big concern. Plutonium inside the body, however, if it were ingested or inhaled, would be a large concern because this alpha particle causes ionization of cells in the body. These ionized cells then can mutate into cancerous forms and other materials. This is what a microscopic dot of plutonium looks like after it has lodged in the lung of an ape. The star-shaped tracks are caused by alpha particles as they plough through the cells. Tests have shown that to cause cancer requires just 80 millionths of a gram. There are now about 200 tonnes, maybe 250, 200,000 kilograms of plutonium that have been recently in nuclear warheads or are still in nuclear warheads. There are about a thousand tons of highly enriched uranium uh, associated with nuclear weapons throughout the world. The total number of nuclear weapons that have, that include ones that have already started to be dismantled is somewhere around 60,000. As we dismantle the weapons and take out the highly enriched uranium and the plutonium, big question, what do we do with it? This is the quick way of disposing of plutonium. It's also the simplest. From a global environmental viewpoint, it's probably also the safest, but no one's going to endorse the routine detonation of over 60,000 warheads in this fashion. So, now we have hundreds of tons of poisonous, radioactive explosive material that no one is quite sure what to do with. Scientists are currently debating the options, the costs, and the risks. In a simple-minded way, there are four choices. One is use it in fuel, which many people advocate. A second is bury it somewhere. Uh, a third is transmute it, convert it into isotopes that cannot be used for making bombs. And fourth, uh, put it in space or dump it in the sun. If all you want to do is to stop people making bombs out of plutonium, then vitrification is a favoured option. It's a technology that the Americans and the British are developing. The waste plutonium is contaminated with radioactive poisons to stop anyone attempting to recover it in the future, and then fused with silica to produce a molten glass. The highly radioactive glass is sealed into steel canisters. Remote probes cover every square centimetre of the casing, checking for any leakage. Once cleared, the canisters are transported to permanent storage areas. So far, they've only been able to develop this procedure for reactor waste. No one has yet been able to successfully vitrify weapons-grade plutonium. If and when they do, it will have to be stored away from any natural or man-made disturbance for a quarter of a million years. You've got to be very sure that over the 
many, many years that the material was in the ground or buried or in some sort of a uh, geologic site, that the, uh, that the materials that are encapsulating the, the plutonium and the poisons that have been inserted in the plutonium don't all drop away and that over many, many thousands of years what you'll have is a, an accumulating deposit of pure plutonium. The Russians, however, have little intention of throwing away what they see as a valuable resource. Ну, как-то не в курсе той сложности, того огромного труда, в который вложили люди в производство плутония. На мой взгляд, плутоний – это такое же народное богатство, каким является золото, каким являются драгоценные камни, каким являются другие драгоценные металлы. В этот материал, в плутоний, вложен огромный человеческий труд. Многие люди на этом деле потеряли здоровье, потеряли свои жизни. И считать его каким-то отбросом, но это просто уже будет неуважение к памяти тех людей, которые положили на это жизнь. And the Russians are right. Plutonium can be used as a nuclear fuel to generate power. Tiny quantities of pure weapons-grade plutonium are mixed with low-grade uranium to produce a fuel known as MOX, mixed oxide. But it's a difficult and expensive procedure and Russia will need massive investment to be able to safely convert their reactors to burn MOX as a fuel. Even then, it's a long way from being a complete solution. Mixed oxide uh, reactors certainly would not be uh, the answer to getting rid of plutonium completely. Uh, if you went the mixed oxide route and you wanted to get rid of the plutonium, you would have to keep reprocessing the spent fuel as it came out of the reactors. In other words, you'd have a mixed oxide fuel, you'd put it in the reactor, burn, burn the fuel in the reactor, withdraw the fuel elements, and then move the fuel elements back to a reprocessing plant, extract the pl remaining plutonium, mix it with uranium, and then stick it back in the reactors again as a, as a mixed oxide fuel. So you'd have to keep recirculating the, uh, the mixed oxide fuel elements to essentially get rid of the plutonium after many, many cycles. Uh, so in a way, the mixed oxide uh, fuel as a once-through fuel certainly would not get rid of plutonium. In spite of the problems, Japan has also been keen to exploit plutonium as a fuel. Conscious of the bad name plutonium had acquired over the years, the Ministry of Atomic Power created a cartoon character, Pluto Boy. Hello everyone, I am Pluto Boy, made from plutonium. It's nice to meet you all. The reason I am doing this is because I feel there are many people out there who think of plutonium as a big, bad monster. Let's say some bad guys decided to throw me into a reservoir. Not only am I difficult to dissolve in water, but because I am heavy, almost all of me would just sink to the bottom of the water. And if by some chance I were swallowed in a mixture of water, almost none of me would be absorbed by the stomach intestines and I would leave the body. The cartoon was withdrawn when the Japanese Minister for Atomic Power was asked to drink a glass of plutonium lace water on public television. He declined. At a small desert town in Nevada, an international conference of nuclear physicists met to discuss another expensive gamble, transmutation. Uh, there are analogies in terms of the gambling world. Uh, people say, well, this is a long shot. This is a big gamble. We think it's a sure bet in terms of being able to develop technology to destroy plutonium and transmute nuclear waste. And so what we envision uh, at Los Alamos is a development program extending over 15 years, uh, funded or requiring uh, funding at a level of some tens of million dollars per year uh, to, to actually demonstrate the technology and so on. 
So it's not a trivial investment. Maybe the total investment may be a half a billion dollars. And this is what they're betting on. It's the Alchemist Dream, a machine that does the 20th century equivalent of turning lead into gold. It destroys plutonium with subatomic bullets. Simply take a hydrogen atom, consisting of a proton with an electron spinning round it, and strip the electron off. Fire the proton into a linear accelerator, and its positive charge causes it to be pushed forward in the front of an electric field like a surfer riding a wave. Three quarters of a mile down the pipe, it's accelerated to almost the speed of light. The proton then smashes into a block of lead at the far end, producing a shower of neutrons that are absorbed into the waste plutonium, breaking it into short-lived or more stable elements. It is, in effect, a very slow, very controlled atomic bomb. The initial experiments seem to be working, but even optimists say that the procedure is 15 years away from being a viable process, and pessimists say that could double. My own work has focused on dumping plutonium in the sun. Uh, the first objection that one hears from anybody to whom that's suggested is, well, what do you do about something like an explosion of the Challenger? Uh, you can't design things so that there won't be uh, launch failures. And if you have a launch failure and you're carrying 10 tons of plutonium, uh, you'd have a global catastrophe. Uh, that's much too uh, superficial. And, if, and there has been quite a lot of work done on, for example, crash-proof containers, which could stand the highest velocity impact that is possible according to the laws of physics. Uh, I think there's a good chance, no guarantee, a good chance that it will begin to look more attractive than burying it in Nevada or uh, extracting the plutonium in a form which, as long as it's extracted, can be used in nuclear weapons, or trying to transmute it. I think all those things need to be looked at. In the meantime, the question is, what do we do? It's a question to which there is no answer. And in the meantime, the plutonium pits sit in their barrels. There is no international or even national policy for plutonium disposal. Each proposed solution creates its own problems, and now, We've got to pay for it. Вы знаете, что по договору ОСВ-2 в 2003 году должно остаться у России и у Соединенных Штатов у каждой из стран не более трех с половиной тысяч ядерных боеголовок. Из них 1750 может находиться на атомных подводных лодках. Три с половиной тысячи, а арсеналы каждой из этих стран приблизительно в десять раз превосходили десять лет тому назад, скажем, эту цифру. Поэтому проблема, конечно, ядерного разоружения, демонтажа ядерного оружия, она не только очень сложная, но и требует колоссальных затрат. Я назову такую цифру, что демонтаж одного ядерного боеприпаса стоит где-то от 30 до 100 тысяч долларов одного. А их надо демонтировать несколько десятков тысяч. With an unstable economy and a lack of hard currency, Russia and the ex-Eastern Bloc countries are in a nuclear limbo. Radioactive waste sites outside of Mamansk are badly contaminated and barely guarded. There are nuclear reactors in desperate need of repair and modernization. A sunken submarine with its warhead still in place lies at the bottom of the Barent Sea. Already, nuclear material has, to use the government euphemism, started to be diverted. In Brest, Western France, smuggled uranium was recovered by the police. And only a few months ago, 350 grams of plutonium were seized in Germany. 
for sale material is now for sale on the open market. But perhaps most frighteningly, it's not just the bomb's plutonium that we need to worry about. Much of the recently smuggled material appears to have come not from atomic weapons, but from civilian reactors. A uranium fuel rod in the reactor's core decays into a variety of byproducts, one of which is plutonium. As the reactor runs, the plutonium builds up, contaminating the fuel rods. Here in Britain, at Thorpe, the thermal oxide reprocessing plant in Sellafield, waste plutonium is extracted from spent fuel rods, allowing them to be recycled and returned to the reactors. It's a commercial service they offer to those countries that use nuclear power for peaceful purposes, and they hope to be extracting around five to six tons of plutonium a year by the end of the century. There are over 250 tons of weapons-grade plutonium in the world, but already there are over 1,000 tons of civilian reactor grade. Although it's an inevitable consequence of running an atomic reactor, there are those who prefer not to acknowledge the dangers of reactor-grade plutonium. It was a question posed in the House of Lords only last year to Baroness Chocker. Could the noble Baroness confirm that under part B of this wearisomely repetitious question, that reprocessed plutonium from commercially operated power stations is not suitable for weapons manufacture? To the best of my knowledge, my lords, that is so. And may I also say that we are extremely careful in any question concerning reprocessing, be it of plutonium or other dangerous substances. But if that question had been posed to a nuclear scientist, then the answer would have been somewhat different. There's no such thing as safe plutonium from the standpoint of constructing a fissile weapon or a fission weapon. Reactor-grade plutonium can and has been used to construct a fission weapon. From that standpoint, all plutonium has to be considered a risk for, in terms of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. It was just recently revealed by the U.S. government that it was British plutonium that was used in a test in 1962 to determine that so-called reactor-grade plutonium, the kind of plutonium that comes out of a commercial nuclear power plant, could be used in a bomb. And therefore, it's rather remarkable that the British government only last year was saying in defense of the decision to start up Thorpe that, and I'll quote, it is not the government's policy to give further information on this or to comment on the details of any nuclear weapons test which may be alleged to have been carried out, unquote. Now obviously the British government knew at that time that it was their plutonium that was used by the U.S. Uh, to determine that reactor grade plutonium could be used in a bomb. And therefore uh, one has to question the, uh, the sincerity and the truthfulness of, uh, of that statement. Uh, the problem is that uh, in Britain and in France uh, the general public has not been fully informed of the risks involved in the commercial uh, plutonium program. Uh, out there in spent fuel pools associated with uh, about 400 nuclear power plants distributed worldwide is enough uh, radioactive material so that if that were bombed with a nuclear weapon, for example, downwind, it could cause uh, uh, fallout on a scale that I think it would be fair to call, in some cases, continental. When these paragliding protesters landed in a Swiss nuclear power plant, they were carrying only banners. And as Ted Taylor says, let's hope that is all they ever carry. One can imagine, I don't want to go into this in any detail, one can imagine scenarios in which a few terrorists could trigger a result which could uh, be the biggest catastrophe ever suffered by human beings. We can't have that. Plutonium uh, is named after the god of hell, and I think it is well named. 